Hello and welcome to tonight's book reading session of Preparing for the Day After, a picture ebook. Preparing for the Day After is a photojournalistic treatise on disaster mitigation published by me, Malini Shankar and Walter Keller for the 10th anniversary of the Asian tsunami. Tonight we will learn about early morning and forecasting. It is chapter 19, part 1. But let us first recap what we have learned in the previous book reading session before starting tonight's session. Water and sanitation is central to developmental discourse. Culture sensitive food security also has evolved out of local agrometeorological conditions prevalent in an area. Livelihoods based on Local agrometeorological conditions are the best means of ensuring livelihood security. Climate change adaptation, menstrual hygiene, especially for indigenous tribal women, solid waste management, universal health care access, sustainable development goals, they are all factors to be included in the development agenda. Media personnel have to be trained in reporting disaster preparedness or the lack of it at district level. Disaster is the impact of a calamity on the human landscape. This includes the impact on lives, livelihoods and landscape, as well as on livestock. Tonight we will start with the chapter on early warning and forecasting calamities. The absence of an early warning system in place around the Indian Ocean Rim countries was held largely accountable for the large-scale death and destruction wrought by the Asian tsunami in December 2004. There, there was simply no early warning mechanism in place for disaster preparedness around the Indian Ocean. The biggest known, the biggest lesson learned from the disaster of the Asian tsunami was the need for early warning with disaster preparedness. The Pacific Tsunami Warning Center in Honolulu, Hawaii, in the USA, the United States of America, is a sophisticated tsunami forecasting center located bang in the middle of the North Pacific Ocean where tsunamis occur far more frequently than in the Indian Ocean. A reason perhaps for the mysterious non-existence or non-establishment of a tsunami forecasting center anywhere in the entire Indian Ocean Rim region. Even if we presume for an instant that the officers at the Pacific Tsunami Warning Center on duty in Hawaii, it was still Christmas Day 2004, uh, that Christmas afternoon or evening, when the a mega earthquake struck off the coast of Sumatra in the morning on the morning of 26th of December 2004, even if they had called, say, the president of Indonesia or India or Sri Lanka to warn of an imminent tsunami, there was no system of early warning and disaster preparedness in place in any of the Indian Ocean Rim countries. In fact, the WHO report Tsunami 2004, a comprehensive analysis, states that geophysicists and marine geologists at PTWC, that is the Pacific Tsunami Warning System, did try to contact the State Department to inform authorities in Indonesia. The Pacific Tsunami Warning Center located in Hawaii was established to protect coastal communities surrounding the Pacific Ocean where tsunamis most commonly occur. But the center receives data on seismic activity from all over the world. And while the Sumatra and Ribbon earthquake occurred in the Indian Ocean rather than in the Pacific Ocean, it quickly caught the attention of the geophysicists staffing the center at the Pacific Tsunami Warning Center. At about 15 hours, that is about 3 o'clock in the afternoon in Hawaii, Geophysicists Stuart Weinstein and Barry Hershorn received seismic data suggesting that a magnitude 8 earthquake had occurred along the sea flow just off the coast of Indonesia. And within 15 minutes of the earthquake, they issued a Pacific wide tsunami information bulletin informing countries in and around the Pacific basin of the estimated size and location of the detected earthquake. Weinstein and Hershorn, however, could not report on whether the earthquake had generated a tsunami. Had the earthquake occurred in the Pacific Ocean, they would have analyzed in real time satellite data transmitted from tsunami sensors and other water level instruments in order to determine whether the earthquake had indeed generated a tsunami. But when Weinstein and Hirschhorn looked for water level data in the Indian Ocean, they found none as no satellite transmitted data on water levels in the vicinity of the Sumatra Andaman earthquake existed. Because Indonesia and Thailand border both the Indian Ocean and the Pacific Ocean, they would have received the warning center tsunami bulletin reporting on the earthquake. 
but it is unclear what kind of response if any the bulletin triggered in either country neither indonesia nor thailand had a recent history of a major tsunami and thus the possibility of a tsunami occurring might not have raised serious concerns other countries surrounding the indian ocean lay entirely outside the pacific ocean basin and did not receive the tsunami bulletin at an estimated magnitude of 8 however there was little reason to believe that the earthquake would produce a tsunami that would impact any region other than northern indonesia if it produced one at all 45 minutes after the earthquake weinstein and hershon performed a slower but more accurate method for calculating the size of the earthquake and realized that the earthquake was much larger than they had previously estimated the geophysicists received the earthquake's estimated magnitude sorry revised the earthquake's estimated magnitude magnitude upward to 8.5 which would have released approximately 16 times more energy than a magnitude 8 earthquake they summoned advice from the director of the warning center geophysicist charles mcreary and subsequently issued a a second bulletin reporting that the earthquake was larger than the first estimated and that a tsunami had may have been generated At this point the geophysicists believed a small local tsunami had already affected Indonesia. What they did not know is that even the second calculation had seriously underestimated the earthquake's magnitude and although an earthquake gen- earthquake generated tsunami already had impacted Indonesia uh it was neither min- it was neither small nor local. In Indonesia the tsunami resulted in waves of up to 30 meters in height. Uh and within 45 minutes of the earthquake the tsunami had devastated coastal areas of the northern indonesian province of aceh but the tsunami did not limit its course to destruction in indonesia only approximately 3 hours after the earthquake the geophysicists found an internet news report indicating a tsunami had hit thailand they were shocked to learn that the earthquake had triggered a tsunami large enough to cause casualties and destruction along a 600 kilometers from along a coast of 600 kilometers from the earthquake's epicenter Soon after, an email from Harvard University seismologist helped to explain the destruction. The email indicated that the earthquake was of at least magnitude 9, an earthquake with an energy equivalent of about 32 magnitude 8 earthquake. Of about 32 magnitude 8 earthquake, Weinstein, Hershon, and McCreary realized that more countries still might be in danger, and with the help of the U.S. State Department, frantically tried to reach anyone that could evacuate coastlines that had not yet been hit. <coughs> Meanwhile, the tsunami moved quickly, radiating out from the earthquake's epicenter at about a, the speed of a air, uh, jet airplane. By this time, the tsunami had already impacted many countries, having reached Indonesia and India's Andaman Nicobar Islands within minutes of the earthquake. Sri Lanka, Sri Lanka, India's mainland, and Thailand in about two hours, and the Maldives in about three hours. Although it was too late to warn these countries, the geophysicists hoped to warn countries along the East African coast. Finally they reached the US embassies in Mauritius and Madagascar and the embassies promised to warn Somalia and Kenya which had not yet been hit. Kenya received the warning with enough time to evacuate coasts before the tsunami arrived and only one person was killed by the forces of the tsunami. Had there been in the Indian Ocean basin a better system in place for detecting warning and evacuating coastline lives possibly could have been saved in many more countries and greater public recognition of a tsunami warning sign could have spared even more lives unquote a much simpler way of disseminating such critical information would have been the role of a well informed news media it would at least have saved time spent on interpretation through satellites elaborate protocol of contacting embassies through the foreign ministry bureaucrats etc like dr m a atman former director of the national institute of ocean technology says there was no system in place for tsunami warning in india other than some seismic station also the measurement system of tide data and bottom pressure recorder was not in place for collecting these data and putting it in a model as it exists now hence t- technically speaking the mechanism in uh, in place now did not exist at that point of time he said there was no way that measures like mass evacuation forecasting the likely path of the tsunami highlighting vulnerable coasts broadcasting the early warning messages sounding sirens information dissemination housing the evacuees in shelters providing them food medicine and clothing in emergency shelters earmarking evacuation re- 
routes etc could have been executed without a system in place in the indian ocean rim country surprising considering indonesia is highly geologically volatile and has had a number of seismic events including the eruption of the krakatau super volcanic eruption in 1883 which triggered a tsunami Indonesia did not have a tsunami forecasting center till well till well after the Asian tsunami. Indonesia hosts a number of super volcanoes among its 130 active volcanoes. Lake Toba, Krakatau, Mount Merapi, Tambora are only a few such super volcanoes in Indonesia that have triggered tsunami. Lake Toba even ushered in climate change over 7 millennia ago. Lake Toba covered entire modern day Asia in 15 cm of volcanic ash as its Ah, uh, it is believed. But then, like Dr. Tuku Alvis Yashin, former director of the Tsunami Disaster Research Center at the Sia Kuala University in Banda Aceh, says the mega earthquake was one of the biggest earthquakes we had ever felt in Sumatra, even though we are used to earthquakes. Unquote. Yet. Most Indonesians had not heard of a tsunami. I had heard of it but did not know that an earthquake would trigger it. As I said before in my subconscious mind, I had thought that the roaring sound approaching the back of my house could be water. But the word tsunami had not crossed my mind at that point. Nevertheless, nevertheless, this that scary thought and sound prompted me to rush outside again, calling on everyone to run because I was sure the water would reach us. Sure enough, less than 2 minutes later, the tsunami wave ravaged our neighborhood, which is about about 4 kilometers from the coast of Banda Aceh as Dr Alves Yashrin There were no foreshock. I I just could see the tsunami wave, though I did not see the sea withdraw. Says Malizar Zakaria, who was then 29 years old and worked as a teacher for senior high school, that is SMA one in Banda Aceh district, at the time of the Asian tsunami. On seeing cattle running, we thought it was a communal flare-up, but we started feeling water inundating our feet. Says Mr. Dawson in Bangalore, whose entire family of six people were miraculously saved from the tsunami tsunami in Velangani, Tamil Nadu, India, by a sheer quirk of fate. We stepped into the flooded street. crossed the road and ran towards a building opposite the current of the water was so fierce i remember it was difficult to stand firm hundreds of people screaming running towards the building to save their life as rupa prabhu dawson to dawson's daughter in fact rupa kept looking back over her shoulders looking for the next wave as we started walking inland to later that afternoon as mrs margaret dawson rupa's mother the second wave was coming in menacingly at around 11 am i saw the surface of the wave was calmer than the fierce knots under the wave it seemed to be knotting in traction backward and this holy whole tensely knotted wave was rising up to become a mountain on the sea the sea seemed to be 20 meters higher than normal sea level and then this mass of water just collapsed on the shore so you can imagine the terror we faced there in vilangani on this particular link is a uh, there of, on the home page of the pacific tsunami warning center there are answers to diverse questions on tsunami the pacific tsunami warning center monitors tsunami genic earthquakes volcanic triggers and submarine landslides to issue appropriate tsunami warnings to the countries and coasts most likely to be affected in the geologically volatile pacific ring of fire should a tsunami trigger be triggered by any one of the common factors earthquake volcano submarine or coastal landslide the ptwc that is the pacific tsunami warning centers warnings are communicated to a labyrinth of agencies in accordance with standard operating procedure which act independently on actionable inputs Other rare triggers of tsunami like an iceberg falling into a ocean or a meteor fall into the ocean have not been recorded so far. The Pacific Tsunami Warning Center documents the causes for the generation of tsunamis. Anything that rapidly displaces a large volume of water can cause a tsunami. Typically tsunamis are caused by underwater earthquakes but landslides, volcanic eruptions, carving icebergs and very rarely meteorite impacts can also generate tsunami. These types of events can cause large disturbances in the surface of the ocean and the ocean flow and when gravity pulls the water back down a tsunami is born the sum of the sum total of the actions taken by the anointed agencies in conformance to standard operating procedures ensures that the most vulnerable population is saved from the tsunami the actionable inputs may include broadcast dissemination of early warning sounding sirens evacuation housing in temporary shelters etc early warning is only as effective as the mock drills as a japanese tsunami of 11th march 2011 clearly 
clearly demonstrated. The Government of India established the Indian National Centre for Ocean Information Services in Hyderabad in 1999 under the AGs of the then Department of Ocean Development under the currently under the Ministry of Earth Sciences. INCOIS, as it's referred to, was given the responsibility of setting up the National Tsunami Early Warning Centre in the aftermath of the Asian Tsunami. IOC UNESCO, that is Intergovernmental Oceanographic Committee, or that's IOC, has identified INCOIS as one of the regional tsunami service providers for the entire Indian Ocean region and along with the centers in Australia and Indonesia provide tsunami bulletins for about 25 Indian Ocean Rim countries that are part of the ICG IOTWS framework that is Indian Ocean Tsunami Warning Center must be warning service or whatever framework. India also enacted the National Disaster Management Act of 2005. Indonesia legislated Disaster Management Act in 2007 and set up the JTIC or the Jakarta Tsunami Information Center under the Intergovernmental Oceanographic Committee that is IOC of the UNESCO and is funded by the Canadian International Development Agency. It was established to increase and strengthen awareness about tsunami to assist the development of the tsunami early warning system in Indonesia. JTIC is an information center, not a tsunami warning website. The main aim of the center to, is to act on the progress of uh, tsunami early warning systems in Indonesia in terms of technical development, education, preparedness, tsunami drills, establishment of standard operating procedures, etc. General information activities, news and issues, min materials to support public awareness. Located in the UNESCO office Jakarta, JTIC of focuses on the information provision through internet so that anyone can have full and global access to it. The JTIC website hosts tsunami-related information, materials, data, programs, etc. in order to be accessible and publicly used. It also provides a discussion forum for those who are interested in exchanging information about tsunami-related topics. India's Indian National Center for Ocean Information Services, its mandate is to research and draw conclusions based on interpretation of oceanographic data for disaster mitigation. INCOIS has a tsunami early warning center, the inputs of which are subscribed by agencies anointed in the standard operating procedure under various nodal ministries. INCOIS is an operational oceanographic institute that has infrastructure for dissemination of huge data obtained from sources like satellites, moored buoys, satellite tracked buoys, autonomous profiling floats as well as from other scientific institutions like NIO that is National Institute of Oceanography, National Institute of Ocean Technology, NCAOR that is National Center for Atmospheric and Oceanographic Research I think, CMLRE, IMD, NCMRWF, IITM which is Indian Institute of uh, Tropical Meteorology, NCES, etc. Uh, most of which I don't know. At INCOIS, our oceanographers break down data like ocean winds, sea surface temperature, profiles of temperature and salinity of water column, ocean currents, etc. and offer interpretations on how these factors affect a whole gamut of issues. These could be tidal levels, wave patterns, potential fishing grounds or early warnings of tsunamis. INCOIS generates and provides such information to fisher folk, navigators, maritime industry, coastal population, disaster management agencies, etc. on a regular basis, says Director of INCOIS, Dr. Satish Chenoy, in an exclusive email given to me for this book. Here is a link for a graphic display of the NOAA of how bottom pressure recorders interact with tsunami buoys for satellite transmission of tsunami forecasts across the Pacific Ocean. The link is, putting, is going to be put up here as well as in the description box below this video. These inputs are meant to be coordinated in India by the National Disaster Management Authority to mitigate disaster risk in the face of an imminent calamity. The actionable inputs may include dissemination of early warning, recommended areas for evacuation, sounding sirens and signals in the identified areas to alert the population to act as per the indoctrinated procedures demonstrated in mock drills that is and governed by standard operating procedures. In fact, the Andaman Nicobar Island Administration has earmarked tsunami evacuation routes and portrayed signs in local Nicobari language too. There are assembly points for evacuees, designated evacuation routes, portrayals of do's and don'ts, testing of sirens every fortnight, regular mock drills and training of volunteers in the youth committees, disaster response task forces, etc. all well anointed. A whole system kicks in once the early warning has been sounded. Sirens blare, people run to assembly points, those who cannot run to safety are ideally assisted. But 
predetermined assistance for frail, infirm, physically and mentally challenged people, more vulnerable groups of people are still wanting in India or for that matter in South Asia. In fact, this sensitivity is missing in all the emerging economies. Mass transport vehicles, administrative staff and military personnel are on alert and standby to help evacuate the islanders to safety in India's Andaman Nicobar Islands according to the guidelines at least. However, Zubair Ahmed, a journalist in Fort Blair, told me in an interview that uh, inadequate public transport remains a big challenge. The inadequacy of public transport implies that the challenge lies in translating policy into action, he says. Military trucks are most certainly not conducive to evacuating civilians as it involves climbing with ropes and without steps. In fact, one Air Force officer who participated in a drill or a evacuation and for who obvious reasons and for obvious reasons prefers to remain, uh, remain anonymous in Khan Nicobar tells me in an interview Evacuating islanders with military trucks causes concern. In Andaman Nicobar Islands, infrastructures like roads and a motley public transport service that operates for islanders is used for frequent evacuation during drills and when early warning bulletins are sounded. The road networks to the interior tribal areas in Nicobar Islands has improved, certainly giving access to interior tribal pockets that were hitherto inaccessible even to officials working in the island. Disaster management committees and task force, task force volunteers man the assembly points like community halls, school buildings, etc. and oversee safety and supplies till the all clear is sounded and the early warning is lifted. Of all the temporary shelters seen by the author, that's me, in Tamil Nadu, Pondicherry, Andaman Nicobar Islands, Orissa and Himachal Pradesh, the ones in Andaman Nicobar Islands seem to be well maintained even if they still lack earthquake safe certification. Attempts are being made to automate the whole early warning system to be executed on cell phones SMS mechanism, said Lieutenant Governor of Andaman Nicobar Islands, Lieutenant Governor retired A.K. Singh during an audience he granted to me on the 21st of March 2014 at Raj Nivas in Port Blair, Andaman Nicobar Islands. We need automated early warning, uh, which should be activated and delivered to subscribers. Battery or electricity and energy backup are issues in Nicobar Islands. Sites have been identified by INCOI, says Mrs. Sakshi Mittal, Indian Administrative Service Officer, Deputy Commissioner of Nicobar District, in an exclusive interview given to me. When INCOI can offer an earthquake alert on SMS, why cannot the same technology be replicated for tsunami warning from INCOI? To date, tsunami warnings often warranted for Andaman Nicobar Islands is not delivered by SMS to cell phone subscribers most needed for the islander. It would be low cost and a surefire way of mass communication or WhatsApp. Beyond six kilometers from subdivisional headquarters in Campbell Bay or the Great Nicobar Island, which is the largest in Nicobar Islands, there are no cell phone signals due to lack of towers. There is no landline telephone connectivity here at at all in all the villages of the Great Nicobar Island, also called Campbell Bay, said Akhil Kishore, Assistant Commissioner of Campbell Bay or Great Nicobar Island, in an exclusive interview given to me on the 10th of March 2014. It is not clear if there were any mortalities because the incumbent Assistant Commissioner was new to the posting. During that is during the April 11, 2012 earth strike slip earth. Power supply is unreliable during disasters as it happened in April 2012. Power supply is usually snapped during emergencies as part of SOP which affects early warning, but it should be switched off after the sirens are sounded. This is a crucial shortcoming. There is no gain saying authorities are accountable. Sirens functionality need remotely activated uninterrupted power supply. SOP that is standard operating procedure demands that power supply shuts down only after the sirens have been sounded, confirms DC Mittal. If sirens fail to go off because of incessant power supply and lives are lost, India's government servants will largely fail to account, such as the maze of inefficiency sometimes. Thus, it is essential that this problem of power outage before sirens are sounded has to be streamlined before a single life is lost unwarranted. The buck stops at the head of the district administration failing which at the chief administrator of the islands, the lieutenant governor of the island. The highly pro proactive incumbent lieutenant governor of Andaman Nicobar Islands at, at, the, at that point, also blessed with an immense popularity among islanders, is called upon to attend to such anomalies in the administration and execution of early warning. 
There is no special infrastructure support to offer extended support like priority assisted evacuation to frail, infirm, physically challenged people and people with mental health issues in the entire Andaman Nicobar Island system, island administration or island chain. Assistant Commissioner Kishore told me that there are seven differently abled persons on the Campbell Bay Island and nodded his head in the negative when I asked if there are any special arrangements or infrastructure support for evacuating these seven differently abled people. It is not easy for the administration to put such an elaborate system in place in such a remote area. Credit is due to the political will, scientists and the dedicated officers who have made this a reality so far indeed. However, there are a few, few glaring gaps which ought to be documented. Despite a labyrinth of agencies involved in standard operating procedure, All India Radio and Doordarshan, that they are the state broadcasters, have still not been included as of November 2014. Consequently, these two state broadcasters are not officially obliged to broadcast early warning. The reach of All India Radio and Doordarshan in, in Andaman Nicobar Islands is unparalleled. Yet, there is no officially satisfactory explanation for why neither of the state-run broadcasters is excluded from broadcasting early warning. RTI applications filed by me did not elicit replies from AIR, that is All India Radio and Doordarshan in Port Blair within the period of 30 days. However, the delayed response I got received merits public receive merits publication at least for the tardiness with which it is addressed my right to information ap application got a reply saying uh, got that i got from all india radio port blair talks of quote this office has not been received has not been received any tsunami alert on the 11th of april 2012 as per records available in this office my questions were why has all india radio and doordarshan stations in port blair not yet been notified for broadcast of early warning bulletins issued by itewc of incoil why did all india radio not broadcast the tsunami watch and alert issued by itewc incoil when the april 11 2012 strike slip earthquake triggered a tsunami watch and alert for Kamorta and Kachal Islands of Nicobar district. To this, the reply from All India Radio was not applicable to this office. This office has not been received any tsunami alert on the 11th of April 2012 as per records available in this office. To say the least, this is accountability of government officials to the taxpayer. But to see it objectively, private sector radio, for instance, are even less accountable. Advertising centric, advertising centric private radio, please even the advertisers and do not intimate advertisers for change in programming content. It is a rather rare private sector entity or individual whose commitment can be held accountable, at least in India. There was, there was at the very least a written response from All India Radio Port Blair. Doordarshan in Port Blair did not even bother to reply. Yes, there was no reply from Doordarshan to a right to information application filed by me. If All India Radio Port Blair pays the question, why has all why has All India Radio and Doordarshan stations in Port Blair not yet been notified for broadcast of early warning bulletins issued by ITEWC of INCOIS can be answered with not applicable to this office? Does it need more corroboration than they only need a pensionable job, even if the people they are meant to serve risk death. The author was left speechless. I mean, I there is nothing you can say for such callous here, but you need to hold them to account. A release from INCOI says the tsunami advisories are disseminated to the following agencies. Ministry of Home Affairs, Government of India. National Disaster Management Authority, Government of India. Battalions of National Disaster Relief that is Government of India, that is NDRF of the Government of India, Coastal State Disaster Relief Commissioners, Indian Coast Guard and Indian Navy Government of India, Administration of Nuclear Power Plants in the Coastal States, Disaster Management Administrators from Andaman Nicobar Islands and Director General of News of Doordarshan and All India Radio who sit in Delhi, not the stations in Port Blair. Well, it has not yet happened 32 months after the April 2012 strike slip earthquake triggered a tsunami warning. Despite pointed news reports to this effect and heated discussions on online e-groups, the matter has not received the attention of India's National Disaster Management Authority. Why? After the new government was sworn in on in May 2014, NDMA was dissolved with all members being asked to resign. 
Apart from a working secretariat that functions without direction, NDMA is a non-entity despite legislation in India today. This remains a bureaucratic record only on paper but is not implemented. The truth remains that even two years, eight months after the April 11, 2012 strike slip earthquake which triggered a tsunami watch and alert, the tsunami early warning bulletins are not broadcast on All India Radio and Doordarshan for they have apparently not received the intimation for it. If press reports are ignored and even RTI responses are treated indifferently, what more can be said or done to the behemoth of Indian bureaucracy? The very fact that these birdies are manning the stations is blasphemous, to say the least. In Indonesia too, not all works perfectly in the early, early warning system. Dr. Tyuku Alvis Shahrin, former director of TDMRC, that is the Tsunami Disaster Mitigation Research Center in the Sia Kuala University in Banda Aceh, told me in an exclusive email interview, and I quote, when the earthquake of April 11, 2012 occurred, I was not in Banda Aceh. I was out of town attending a conference. But within minutes of the earthquake, I got a call from my family telling me that a big earthquake had just occurred and everyone had to evacuate because of fear of the tsunami. They expected a tsunami warning that strong after that strong quake, but the evacuation was for the most part not in response to the early warning system. As I was told later by colleagues, nor that the system siren deployment itself was not according to the established procedure. People responded to the earthquake by running away from the coastal areas towards safety because most of them understand that there could be potentially a tsunami following such a strong earthquake. Only two sirens installed in Banda Ache worked as they were supposed to. The other four were not actively autom activated automatically, rather by a technician who did it manually. Just like in other tsunami exposed Asian countries, we still have issues to work on for tsunami early warning system. We still have many procedural loopholes to work on and need to strengthen our regulatory framework for effective early warning system implementation. The Indian Air Force Base in Kanekoba has documented the occurrence of a water spout on the Air Force Beach, which according to squadron leader Ekta Botra, reached a height of 1000 meters from sea level in the pre-monsoon months of 2013. Seismologist Dr. Arun Bapat in Pune says, and I quote, a water spout can reach such heights only if it is pummeled by volcanic plume. Lest a normal height of spouts is only 20 to 30 meters. Could it be that there is a fresh new volcanic site developing? There is no quantifiable research and early warning for volcanic or allied co-seismic activities in Andaman Nicobar Island. The island administration seems cocky and confident in being prepared for the next monster tsunami but is clueless about the after effects of the last tsunami. Despite repeated attempts to seek the standpoint of the Disaster Management Authority regarding sinkhole preparedness, for example, in Andaman Nicobar Island's administration, there was no response. RTI applications filed by me for clarity regarding water spout documentation was acknowledged, many response was acknowledged Many responses from other authorities were received, but no, no response was received from the Department of Science and Technology, which was asked to respond to the query on sinkholes. According to established procedure, till the Disaster Management Authority seeks the opinion of the Geological Survey of India, the Geological Survey of India will not undertake the survey or investigations for co seismic activities like sinkholes or fumaroles. Meanwhile, a local daily in Port Blair has reported that a pit has appeared inside the premise of the cellular a jail in Port Blair and is reportedly emitting foul smell. So there you are, that's a sinkhole developing. According to established procedure, till the Disaster Management Authority seeks the opinion of the Geological Survey of India, the GSI will not undertake the survey or investigations for co-seismic activities like sinkholes or fumaroles. Meanwhile, okay, I think I finished the paragraph. Standard operating procedure, the Indian Ocean Tsunami Early Warning Center services for an earthquake event comments this now reading these kind of bulletins in this kind of chapter i can't read it it's got some technical language i can't even read the latitude and longitude and the depth etc this cannot read this advice for regions under warning marked in red the public should be advised to move in land towards higher grounds uh, Vessels should move deep in, into deep ocean. For regions under alert, which is in orange color, 
Public should be advised to avoid beaches with low-lying coastal areas. Vessels should move into deep ocean. For regions under watch, that is in yellow color, no immediate action is required. This bulletin is being issues, issued as advice. Only national or state or local authorities and disaster management officers have the authority to make decisions regarding the official threat and warning status in their coastal areas and any action to be taken in response. Updates. Additional bulletins will be issued by the ITEWC in COIS for this event as more information becomes available uh, then they have given their contact information etc uh, this was all this bulletin was issued after the strike slip earthquake triggered a tsunami or uh, a local tsunami for on the 11th of april 2012 end of bulletin when the april 11 2012 strike slip earthquake off the west coast of sumatra triggered a tsunami warning a tsunami forecast bulletin was issued by incoices tsunami early warning center Incoist detected this event in a mere four minutes, issued the first earthquake or qualitative tsunami threat assessment bulletin in six minutes, followed by a detailed quantitative tsunami threat assessment bulletin in 12 minutes. A total of six bulletins were generated for this event and disseminated to the offices of the Chief Secretary of the Union Territory of Andaman Nicobar Islands, Deputy Commissioner of Nicobar Islands or District, Disaster Management Authority Andaman Nicobar Islands, Police Indian Reserve Battalion, Andaman Public Works Department, Andaman Lakshadweep Harbour Works, Ministry of Home Affairs, the Indian Meteorological Department, etc. All India Radio and Doordarshan, India State Run Public Broadcasters are to date not included in the Information Dissemination Network. On this particular link, which can be read, an article by me in Interpress News Service, where the chinks in disaster preparedness armour in India's Andaman Nicobar Islands have been exposed. Let us study this by example. When the April 11, 2012 strike slip earthquake off the west coast of Sumatra triggered a tsunami warning, a tsunami forecast bulletin was issued by Incoises Tsunami Early Warning Center and disseminated to the offices of the Chief Secretary of the Union Territory of Andaman Nicobar Islands, Deputy Commissioner Nicobar District, Disaster Management Authority ANI, Police IRBN, that is the Indian Reserve Battalion, Ministry of Home Affairs, Indian Meteorological Department, etc. All India Radio and Doordarshan, India State Run Public trans broadcasters are to date not included in the information dissemination network and that is all for tonight we have finished the first part of chapter 19 early warning and forecasting next week i will continue with part two of chapter 19 on early warning and forecasting uh, tonight uh, there will be no live interaction because there has been a big problem for us with the youtube uh, going live for the interaction very simple i'm having a technical server problem so i will not be doing uh, live interaction tonight but uh, next week i hope to have questions for the, for this chapter as well uh, please do tune in for next week's video as well we will hopefully conclude the chapter on for, uh, early warning and forecast uh, thank you very much for tuning in take care keep smiling stay home and stay safe